So I'm curious, like, and you protect yourself, you hide. I don't mean in a withdrawing sort of way, but I mean, you live in Texas, you don't live in LA and you right. go on these sojourns where no one knows you. So you, you set up escape mechanisms, let's say, or. Yes. So what, tell me about fame and, and about the impact that it's had on you. So initially, fame and fame happened to me extremely quickly. It happened over one weekend when a film of Time to Kill came out. Um, the Friday afternoon before Time to Kill opened that Friday night, um, I'm walking down a promenade in Santa Monica to go get my tuna fish sandwich that I always like to get. Mm -hmm. 400 people on the promenade, 396 mind their own business. Four of them look and staring at me. A couple girls thought I was cute. Somebody liked my shoes. A hundred scripts out there that I want to do. I'll do any of those. 99 no's, one yes. Now, within 48 hours, time to kill open up that weekend. Very, very good. Get good reviews, et cetera, et cetera. That Monday, following Monday, 48 hours later, I got down the same promenade, everything inverted. Now, 396 out of those 400 people were staring at me, and four weren't. And I nose, check and fly, what have you. Now, those 90, those 100 scripts that were 99 no's and one yes inverted. 99, yes, please do this. And right. one other. Whoa, the roof has been taken off. Oh my God, you're so good. I love you. Oh my God, hey, I'm so sorry about Miss Hud. Number one, who are you? How'd you know I had a dog? How'd you know her name was Miss Hud? And how'd, how'd you know she had cancer? Whoa, you just skipped four things. Nobody's a stranger anymore. Everyone seems to have an, an inherent biography of me. I'm feeling trespassed on it. Is it okay? Does that I love you mean something? Boy, they say that a lot out here. I've only said that to four people in my life. You shouldn't throw that word around here a lot. Maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, oh, yeah. So trying to take that in. Um, I learned a great lesson after year seven of fame. And I, it's probably year seven for a reason. How, how old were you when that, when that happened? 96, um, 1888, eight years later, 26 years old. 26. So you're still pretty young, but you weren't 17. So you had yeah. some maturity. You had some maturity at that point. Thank yeah, God. Yeah, I, I, I know more of what I'm not than maybe more what, than I'm, what I do or what I am. But I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm aware enough of who I don't want to be. And I'm aware enough that I don't want to, that I need some discernation in this now optionless yeses that are coming at me in my world. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm not, that I need to, again, be less impressed and more involved and go, Hey, I'm now that I have the chance, now that I've got the wheel and I can go wherever I want, where am I going to go? Um, which was the first unbalancing sort of very scary proposition which is why I took off the first couple of times to the monastery and then to Christ in the desert. Hear my damn self think, um, trying to decipher and disseminate what matters from what, who am I in this? What do I actually want to do? Um, what do I not want to do? What do I want to make stands on? Look, I remember for a while there, I had such a, my life was so many like things on top. The frequency of events were on top of me from people, just walking, walking down the street to interviews, to talking to somebody. My life was being recorded. The world was now a mirror. And I remember telling my feeling almost numb. I couldn't put a demarcation between the life, the fame I'd just gotten and myself. So I remember telling myself, well, since you're kind of numb, just, I took the old Abraham Lincoln thing. I was like, just be a gentleman and don't lie. All right, just stick to these two things. And I gave some boring ass interviews, but I was a gentleman and I didn't lie. But I just said, like, don't even try and get colorful. Don't even try and have an opinion on anything. Just just right now, ride through this and be a gentleman and don't lie. And I gave the same interview 50 times in a row over, over quite a few months. Yeah, well, there is something to be said um, when you're exposed to that degree to adopting a strategy of don't do anything stupid for a while. <laughs> yes. It, so I was, it was, you know, surviving on the way to what could possibly become thriving, but it was holding my head above water and going, you just keep knocking them down. You'll take some time off. You'll get some time off to let your memory catch up with you later. So to begin with, it was a shock and you've, you developed some strategies for dealing with it. What about over the longer run? Now it's been, you've been, you've been well known for, it's got to be tw 20, well, 25 later. years, eh? 
So 32 or 33 years old, I wake up and it clicks for me one time that, oh, you got to get the joke in Hollywood. And the joke is, it ain't personal. It's business. Right. And that's not a particular joke to Hollywood. Maybe it's a particular joke in, 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 in life a lot. Uh, and in, in, yeah. in business. But that made me go, ah, okay. Don't take it so personally when that person I talked about earlier won't even call you, won't even call your, call you back because your last couple of movies have failed and you spent, you know, you were on the list to be their children's godfather five years ago. Um, don't take that personally or don't take it personally when that person now, because you did get hit, is calling you and wants to go out and hang out again. Don't even bring up that, hey, you wouldn't even answer my, don't even, don't even tell them you understand the score about how they wouldn't call you then, but now they do now. Well, that's a good, that's a good technique to avoid resentment. 